Lord, be a bright flame before us. And a bright fire above us. Shine on and show us the way.
we say we haven't sinned, we lie, and the truth simply is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Two of my favorite prayers here. Let's pray together our prayer of confession. Lord, take us off from the tumult of things into your presence. Show us there what we are and what you purposed us to be and hide us from your tears. And an unusual declaration of the grace of God from Dag Hammarskjöld, President of the United Nations. Pray with me. For all that has been. Yes. To all that shall be. Yes.
Now let's pray. Speak to us, God. Speak to us of who we are and who we can become in your grace, in your name. Amen. First Samuel 17 is in the middle, uh, pretty much the beginning of the story of David. And um, we do have to kind of jump into the middle of the story. But I think it's a, a familiar enough story. Um, 32, if I can find, there we go, okay. Now I'm on uh, 1 Samuel 17, beginning with verse 32. Uh, David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You're just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David just said to Saul, and Saul's the king at the time, he says, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, will save me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, you know, the situation is pretty desperate here now. Goliath, this uh, six-fingered, eight-foot-tall giant, has been uh, pestering and belittling the armies of Israel as they're camped out. And um, it's just become an intolerable situation. David, on the other hand, is just kind of a shepherd. And if he's, you know, stupid enough to go out there and let the Philistine kill him, then I'll, I'll let him, I guess, is sort of Saul's attitude at this point. Um, go and may the Lord be with you, Saul says. And he clothed David with his armor. You know, he just puts on the royal armor. Put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and he tried in vain to walk. <laughs> For he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I can't even walk in these things. For I'm not used to them. So David removed them. He took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the wadi, the, the seasonal uh, stream, and put them in his shepherd's bag, in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And we know the rest of that story. And I and just, I can't resist just, just grabbing this verse just because it's a neat, neat verse. It's, it's from the, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul, who's, I don't know, I don't know what kind of images we have of this guy, but, uh, you know, he comes up with this, verse 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am. He knows who he is. He knows what he is. He knows whose he is. And he's going to be who he is. And he's going to do what he's here to do. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen. So we were, uh, we were over 
Cindy and, and me, were in Florence. Um, and we, were, we went to the Michelangelo Museum to see the David, you know. And the David is an amazing piece of statuary. It's, it's got to be, I don't know, 12, 15 feet high. And then it's real interesting because the hands and feet extremities are out of perspective. They're much larger than they would normally be on the real anatomically correct human being. Uh, but incredibly beautiful, perfectly proportioned, uh, the, the, the shine and the marble. But I, 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 had, I had a trouble because um, you go in there and there's the David up on this little, you know, centered podium. And then all around the walls, two of the walls are lined with these um, kind of bulbous, vaguely bullet-shaped, four or five foot high. You can sort of see the faint outline of a human being or an angel. And then on some of them, he's gone further and you can see more of the angel coming out of the rock. And you can sort of watch the progression as he goes from just a block of marble to an unfinished angel. And the idea of taking that block of marble and turning it into that David is just pretty overwhelming, you know? Charlie reminded me, I did the same thing. We, we, now, it's later, we got our kids and everybody and we're t touring around and um, we had two hours to get through the loop. <laughs> so we're dashing around, you know? And doggone if I'm not stuck in front of the um, unfinished angels again. And I'm looking at this marble and trying to do what David would do, you know, because he would, he would look over all the blocks of cut marble until he found the one that he could see inside of that block, there's a pieta waiting to come out. Inside of this gigantic brick of marble, there's a, there's a David. And he could see what nobody else could see, hidden inside that marble. And he carved it and coaxed it and chipped it and sanded it and dusted it until everything that wasn't Moses was gone. <laughs> and all that's left is the Moses that he saw in that stone. Now that just... I guess the word is potential. I mean, that's a cliche, and I, I almost hesitate to use it, you know, because who needs another speaker up here talking about how I can see all your potential, you know? But that, that's the word, isn't it? When you, when you, can, when you can see a, a, a pieta inside of a block of marble, and then you can go to work with a chisel, and you can bring that pieta out. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can get, I can actually, then I discovered I can get the same thrill, just, uh, well, here's what happened. I was, I went to the museum, I was doing a writer's course for a couple of months, and she had me go on an artist's date every week, and the suggestion was maybe a museum. So I go to the art museum, which is a good idea, you know, and I have a great time and I love the art. And, uh, but I don't know about you with museums, they always have the hardest floors, you know, and the hardest benches. And, and, and I just, I, I, I'm like tired out at 
after two hours of cruising to this museum, I'm like, I gotta sit down someplace soft, you know. I mean, it's good, it's nice, but geez. And then that same week, my daughter had to finish up an art project for school, so unexpectedly, I had to make a quick trip to Michael's Craft Store. And I spent about a half hour at Michael's, and I found that I was bouncing off the wall, you know? I was just pumped up. I, was, I felt great. I felt energized. And I sort of put the two together, and I put the, all those unused armors and uh, unfinished angels and figured, I, I, I really do love potential. I mean, you, you, you can call it kinetic energy if, if, if you want to avoid the cliche. But that is what, I don't know, that makes the world worthwhile to me, to just see who people can become and what we can achieve. Uh, you know, it's thrilling. I, I, I much prefer the empty canvas to the finished masterpiece. <laughs> it's down to that. Give me the blank canvas. When I started a new church in Indianapolis, uh, we had a little office, and on my office I had two uh, frames with nothing inside them, and, and they were our former pastors. It's just, we're doing this one. I'm lousy at hiring people, you know, because I, uh, I mean, I, I really am. I've, I've, I've had five associate pastors, and each one of them has betrayed me tortuously. <laughs> it's, I'm bad at hiring because I uh, see the potential in people, you know, and I believe what they want to accomplish, and I believe them, <laughs> and then... <laughs> Then it turns out they get into their office and spend three days preparing for one Bible study with five teenagers. What about people? You know, you're walking around and you can, uh, you're, you're in the quarry and you can, you're looking at the different blocks. Imagine yourself there for a second trying to see what's inside of each block of marble, and that's shifted to the people. You know, the quarry of the second grade classroom. And what does that teacher see? And what's that teacher going to bring forward and carve away and chip off? The... Uh, the potential of the new hire. What would it be like to see an angel in every person that I came across? I'd like to have eyes like, uh, like that. I know a guy who does. He's cultivated for all of his life this idea of people eyes where he can really see you and see who you are and, and, and uh, what you need. He's an encouraging guy. Now, G.K. Chesterton. Uh, I got a lot of my favorite people in this little reflection here. G.K. Chesterton said, if the seeds buried in the dark black earth can become roses, and what might our hearts become in our long journey toward the stars? Paul, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know, his powerful self-acceptance comes from God's grace. By the grace of God, I am who I am. And without it, he was lost, you know. Or he could grovel all of his life about how guilty he is and all the things he did wrong before. 
I've known some folks who just do that and never get past there and think that that's the sum of the Christian life is to regret everything you did before. Now that's easy to do. Becoming yourself, finding out who you are in the plan of God and becoming yourself and staying true to that vision. Now, that's kind of hard. I gotta try this. I'd never do this. I'm gonna read a little poetry. <laughs> I just wanna share a thought with you. Um, and the thought is so clever. The poem is called Monet Refuses the Operation. So she starts, Doctor, you say there are no halos around the streetlights in Paris? And what I see is an aberration caused by old age and affliction. And I tell you, it has taken me all my life to arrive at the vision of gas lamps as angels, to soften and blur and finally banish the edges you regret I don't see, to learn that the line I call the horizon does not exist and sky and water so long a part of the same state of being, 54 years before I could see Rune Cathedral was built of parallel shafts of sun, and now you want to restore my youthful errors. <laughs> uh, doctor, if only you could see how heaven pulls earth into its arms and how infinitely the heart expands to claim this world blue vapor without end. <laughs> uh, this is an artist being true to himself. Okay, pressure from the medical community and everything, look, we can fix your eyes, you know. And he's saying, no, 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 no. You don't understand at all. You don't understand at all. Uh, I'd like to contrast him I really did know Deacon George. <laughs> I've really got a Deacon George in my uh, quiver here. Uh, Deacon George was the big deacon at the uh, Christian Missionary Alliance Church my mother went to. To become a member, you had to swear that you wouldn't drink or smoke, so my parents couldn't join. <laughs> But my mother liked to go for some reason. So, um, <clears throat> Deacon George was on display quite a bit as a really, um, you know, paragon of virtue. And then he did us a favor, me and the pastor's son. The two of us were going to go off to college and be roommates in the fall. And he, got us with Deacon George, and Deacon George got us a summer job in the garment district where he lived. Oh, I'm sorry, where he worked. So we drove like from Cape Cod to downtown Boston every day, it was a long commute, and the whole time. Deacon George pulls up in front of our house and picked me up on the first day of work, and it is, it, it is insane, I mean, He's got, he's got the radio going up full blast, talking about traffic. Uh, you know, he's got the news traffic radio, and then he's, then he's got the CB radio, and it's going too, and he's cackling, and they're cackling away. And the ashtrays overflowed onto the, onto the floor, and uh, he's chain smoking Kents all the way up to Boston at around 90 miles an hour, <laughs> all the way there. And then he gets to work where he's known as Three Martini George, <laughs> and usually doesn't make it back from lunch. <laughs> How does this guy keep these two worlds together, you know? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that would tear me apart. Uh, you know the word integer? And it means like the number one, 
integer is, is a number, number one. And it's the same root as the word integrity. Integer and integrity. Both start with that concept of one. Um, I don't know how Deacon and George can be those two different people, but I'll tell you, he's not very peaceful in his heart. And um, being yourself, finding out who you are and staying true to that vision is sometimes hard. But don't you feel some obligation to recognize you know, who you are and to make something beautiful out of it? That prayer of the Hebrides we prayed as our confession is take me often from the tumult of things and, 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 and show me who I am and show me who you meant for me to be, uh, who I could have been. Um, okay, David, now let's get all the way up to our text. David and his unused armor. There it is. The royal armor, he couldn't walk in it. I mean, he literally says, I can't walk in this thing, and then falls down, you know. He didn't have to. He didn't have to wear the royal armor and carry the great big sword. He didn't have to be Saul. He had to pick up five smooth stones, and he had to be David. At that time, that might not have been real easy. But you, uh, you find out who you are, and you set out to be that with integrity. I don't have to be David. He picked up his few smooth stones, and when he went out to face the giant, he went in the name of the Lord. And he went as David. He knew who he was. He knew who God was. And he went out there as David. Now most of these images I'm laying on you first time. Most of these just shape my life. I've never forgotten these things. Rabbi Zusha of Hannipal was a popular rabbi, teacher in uh, Ukraine in the 18th century. He had his own yeshiva school to teach the Torah, and he had a famous saying. And I want to I leave it with you, and then we'll come to the table. He says, uh, when I stand before the heavenly court, I shall not be asked, why were you not Moses? I shall not be asked, why were you not Elijah? I shall be asked, Zusha, why were you not Zusha? So, I invite you to bring now as much of yourself as you can to go deep and to bring your heart to this table of God's grace and receive the grace of God to be who you are, hidden in this sacrament, like a statue in a block of marble. Let's commune together.
Let's pray together. God, we come to you as we come to this table, and we thank you, our Creator, for the wonders of this world. And we ask for eyes to see, to, uh, to see how amazing it is and how we fit into your great plan. And we thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who, uh, following your formula, went to Golgotha and died on a cross for, for his people, for us, for all. We thank you for his life and for his death, and we thank you for his resurrection. We thank you for the promise of eternal life. And we open our hearts to that promise as we open our hearts to your spirit. In this sacrament, meet us, comfort us, and fill us with your spirit as we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now hear the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as they're delivered to us by the Apostle Paul. The Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he broke it he gave thanks saying this is the my body, uh, broken for you. Do this remembering me. And in like manner, after they had supped, he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant uh, sealed in my blood, which is shed for you. Do this remembering me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Individually communing uh, for the bread, Jesus Christ is the bread of life. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Now, thank you, God, for loving us. We receive that love as we receive this bread and wine. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Oh, I'm lost. Are we singing? No. Ah, oh, we got to do the Lord's Prayer. Sorry. Been working on that for 68 years. <laughs> Let's pray our Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah. Mm-hmm.